sometime around the year of our Lord, 563, St. Columba set sail from the shores of Ireland to go to Scotland with 12 disciples. And the simple purpose of proclaiming the gospel to the pagan peoples of Scotland. Uh, to that end, this group founded a monastic community on the island of Iona, and really it was our kind of place, a Christ-centered community dedicated to the integration of faith and learning. Uh, shortly after arriving in Scotland, Columba performed a radical act that would help his disciples fulfill their mission believing that the work would be dangerous and that when the going got tough, his men may be tempted to return to their native land, Columba burned the boat that had carried them across the sea. You see, Columba had counted the cost. For him, there would be no going sideways or backwards, only forwards. And he understood that in order to do the things that God had called him to do, he had to pursue those things with a single-minded purpose that ruled out any second guessing. Today, many people have the opposite impulse. We like to keep our options open in case something better might come along. It's a phenomenon, as far as we can tell, first described in a 2004 op-ed that Patrick McGinnis wrote for the Harvard Business School in which he labeled a phenomenon the fear of missing out, or FOMO, to use the, the acronym. Uh, that term became so mainstream in 2013, it entered the Oxford English Dictionary, and uh, to now, uh, today seems to be almost pervasive. One recent study demonstrated that 75% of college students experience some degree of it every day. And here's how it's described, the uneasy, sometimes all-consuming feeling that you're missing out, that your peers are doing or are in the know about or in possession of something more or better than you are. It's the kind of thing that can happen when you see a Facebook post or Instagram photo that makes somebody else's life look more interesting than yours. It's a phenomenon that causes some people to avoid or defer making commitments. It's a very common phenomenon. It's culture-wide. It's been um, studied frequently. The way that uh, young people are deferring the big decisions, like choosing a career, getting married, but it also affects the smaller commitments, like what to do on Friday night. In order to say yes to one thing, we have to say no to everything else, but if you decide too early, you might end up having to say no to something you wish that you could have done. That's, that's the fear. It sometimes makes us more anxious about making decisions. It also weakens the commitments that we do make. We say yes to a friend, but we really mean something more like maybe, and in the end it turns out to be a no. Or, or else we just say maybe, and it never really turns out to be a yes or a no specifically. And ironically, the fear of missing out ends up making us miss out because the only way to experience some things is to make a solid commitment, say yes to it, and then see it through. One of my prayers for you, for your spiritual well-being today, but also for the kingdom work that God is calling you to do in the future, is that you will become the kind of person who is able to make and then keep a commitment. And that's one of the reasons, yet another reason, why I'm so glad to be on a campus where we try to keep the promises that we make to one another before God in our community covenant. I started out the year by identifying what God means by a covenant. It's a love commitment that he will keep with us and for us at the cost of his own blood. And in September, I, I sought to frame the covenant as the way that we say, I love you, at least one of the ways that we do that. And now we're starting to get into more specifics. I'm trying to identify some of the areas where I believe we may need to grow. Now, one of them is in the, in the way that we speak. We, we talked about that last month. How are you doing with that, by the way? Uh, are you winning the war within your soul for words, the words to speak, the words not to speak? Are you criticizing and complaining less? That's a challenging question. Are you building up and blessing more? I hope by the grace of God you are. Maybe you need that reminder this morning. 
But what I want to talk about this morning is the cost of commitment. The cost of commitment, and I'll illustrate that with some of the commitments we make in the covenant, but the very nature of making a covenant compels us to make certain choices, and when we make choices, that will surely cost us something. But it will also help us become the kind of people who really make a difference in the world, people who make and keep life-giving commitments when it would be easier to break them. And part of the paradox here is that some of the constraints of covenant keeping, which honestly are so countercultural, actually give us greater freedom and lead us into a life of greater fulfillment. The benefits outweigh the costs. And one of the great places to see this is in Luke chapter 9. It's been read for us. I'd encourage you to turn to it in a Bible. It's a chapter in which the disciples are going deeper in their commitment to Christ. And the beginning of the chapter, Jesus had sent them out on their first mission trip, and they had gone out to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, to work healing miracles. They had returned with great joy, and then they had witnessed Jesus perform a miracle all his own, the feeding of the 5,000. After that, Jesus went to a private place. And he challenged his disciples to identify who he was. We're we're far enough along in the gospel to really ask that question. Some people were saying this, other people were saying that, but what did the disciples think? Amazingly, Peter came up with the right answer, and Sunday school students have been following his example ever since. He said, you are the Christ. You are the Christ of God. And as soon as Peter had given this answer, correctly identifying Jesus as the promised Messiah, immediately Jesus started telling his disciples what he had come to do. Up until this point in the gospel, as we've been working through it, the coursework has mainly been in Christology, the person of Christ. Who is Jesus? Now, having made this identification, he moves on to soteriology, the saving work that he had come to do. Jesus said, the son of man, this is verse 22, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. The disciples hardly had much notion of what Jesus was saying, but he was prophesying the two great gospel events of his death and resurrection, cross and empty tomb. And all of that was a massive amount to take in, but but immediately Jesus went even deeper. His dying and rising again called them to make a sacrificial commitment. And so with with breathtaking speed, Jesus moves immediately from proclaiming the gospel to applying the gospel, and he tells his disciples first what he had come to do for them, but then immediately he proceeds to tell them what they will do for him. If anyone would come after me, if anyone. In other words, what what follows is a a basic requirement for any follower of Christ. This isn't just for super Christians. It's not for our student chaplains up here in the front row and people that go into Chicago on Friday night with the evangelism team or whoever you admire and think of as somebody who is spiritual. This is just basic Christian discipleship. It's for all of us. And here is what is required. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There you have it. One one simple sentence to take you through a life of Christian commitment. You want to follow Jesus? Just deny yourself. Just die to yourself every day. And apparently, from what Jesus says here, there are no discounts on the cost of Christian discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it well, as you probably know, when Christ calls a man, he calls him to come and die. Let me say it again. When Christ calls a woman, he bids her come and die. But of course, Jesus doesn't just just leave it there. Death is not the end. The gospel always gives life after death. We've been singing that this morning. Death could not hold him. And it can't hold us either. If we're dying in our discipleship, then we are dying to rise again. And so Jesus goes on to say, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He's he's looking forward to eternal life, to the day when the Son of Man will come. He goes on to say this in verse 26, in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I think possibly the best commentary ever 
written on this passage was written by a graduate of Wheaton College. I refer to Jim Elliott. His name is honored on this campus alongside other alums, Nate Saint and Ed McCulley, for paying the ultimate price of martyrdom in the jungles of Ecuador, where they had gone to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Some of you live in their building. Some of you have played on their fields. Do you know their story? Jim Elliott, by all accounts, was a Christian of rare intensity, an incandescent disciple. When he was here at Wheaton, he competed on the wrestling team, belonged to the Student Foreign Missions Fellowship. He studied Greek, memorized poetry, read missionary biographies, majored in Bible. These are some of the things that he talks about when he describes his Wheaton experience. And also began to sense God's call to costly discipleship through missionary service and began to, to sense that he was called to South America. Elliot's journal entry for October 28, 1949, just a few months after he graduated, shows him thinking through the implications of this passage and expressing his view that working for the kingdom is more important than life itself. And after quoting verse 24, he summarized with these memorable words, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. What you cannot keep, that's this earthly existence, which eventually every one of us must lay aside. What you cannot lose, that's the free gift of eternal life. And in his journal, Eliot goes on to quote another saying from the Gospel of Luke, that when the stuff of this present life fails, nevertheless, at that point, God and his holy angels will receive you. This is the beautiful expression of Luke 16 in the King James Version. He will receive you into everlasting habitations. The fools are the ones who live only for this life, and they end up losing their souls. They don't want to miss out. They don't want to miss out on what this life has to offer, but actually they do miss out. They miss out on eternal glory. Jim Elliott was no such fool. He was living into eternity and looking forward to a heavenly home. And that total commitment to Christ took him to the jungles of Ecuador, it took him to the Curare River, it took him to the Warani tribe, it took him to the end of a spear, and ultimately, it took him to a place where a, an entire people group gave their lives to Christ and one day will gather around God's throne to sing his immortal praise. This is where the commitment took Jim Elliot. The kind of person who makes lasting contributions to the kingdom is somebody, I think you will find over and over again, somebody who knows how to keep costly commitments. And one of the places Jim Elliott learned how to do that was right here on this campus with students like you. We have the same opportunity today, and one of the best places we have that opportunity is by keeping the love promises that we make to one another in the community covenant. So many of those promises come at a cost. They, they invite us to, to lose our lives in, in the biblical sense of that phrase. They compel us to miss out on certain things in order to gain greater things, the kinds of things you can only gain by keeping promises. This, this kind of self-denying, Covenant-keeping strengthens our spiritual muscles for keeping ever more costly sacrifices that will end up advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Let me just give you a couple examples of that. The community covenant calls us to show, do you know this phrase? It was in our liturgy this morning. It calls us to show loving regard for the needs of others. It's a beautiful promise that we make. I'm simply quoting the covenant. I, I will show, this is the promise I make, I will show loving regard for your needs. And obviously, in order for me to do that, there are going to be times when I have to certainly set aside some of my wants, but maybe even some of my needs, things that seem like needs, in order so that you get what you need, the care, the comfort, the practical help. That's going to cost me something, especially time, and the things that I wanted to do with it, perhaps. The community covenant calls us to exercise patience as evidence of the Holy Spirit within us. Does that come pretty easily for you? 
or is that more of a challenge? Patience is costly. It means giving up my sense of my right to control my life circumstances in order to give God more time to work, maybe in unexpected ways, and also to give you the time that you need to work something out before God. That's what patience requires, both in our relationship with God and to one another. Here's another one. The community covenant calls us to a holy observance of the Lord's day, meaning Sunday. It's interesting. The covenant doesn't give us any rules for doing that. There's a lot of freedom in the community covenant. If you really look at the community covenant, you'll be amazed at how many things are left at a general principle, then with extraordinary freedom to work out how you will keep that commitment in your own daily life. But if we're, if we're serious about Sabbath keeping, it's going to come at some kind of cost. It's not just another day, Sunday, to get as much work done as I can. Certainly not an excuse to be slothful or a chance to indulge in self-indulgent pleasures. It's a day for godly worship and holy rest and beautiful fellowship and acts of mercy. Now, in each of these loving sacrifices, there is something for us to gain. And that, that's part of the paradox. I show loving regard for your needs Loving you, hopefully, as much as I love myself, I am learning to love the way that Jesus loves. I'm entering more completely into the heart of my Savior. I exercise patience. I'm learning to wait upon God. And how useful is that going to be for me through a life of discipleship? I honor the Lord's day. I'm entering into God's rest. I'm more refreshed for the rest of the week. The only way to get those spiritual benefits is to keep covenant. And those are just... A few examples, we make many costly commitments in our community covenant. Avoiding sexual impurity, abstaining from alcohol and other drugs, taking a bad grade rather than turning in work that isn't really our own, refusing to say something about somebody else that we shouldn't say but wouldn't mind saying anyway. As we keep each of those promises, we are saying yes to something, yes to honesty, yes to charity, yes to self-control, yes, yes to honoring God and one another with our bodies. But we are also saying, and this needs to be said as well, no, no to sexual immorality, no to drunkenness, no to plagiarism, and so on. We are, we are not bowing down to idols, as we uh, sang about this morning in our, in our worship songs. Now, I don't know what the most costly commitment is for you, but it may be a commitment that you wish you didn't have to keep at all. Maybe one you wouldn't keep if you had the choice. And of course, in one sense, you do have a choice. This community is a, is a voluntary community. It's not a compulsory community. That's why we try to make our community covenant clear so that as people join this community, they can decide, is this the way I want to live out the Christian life? And hopefully for many of us, it is the way we would want to live anyway, the way that we essentially chose to live when we gave our lives to Christ. But I realize, of course, this can be a struggle for some members of our community. I think probably a struggle for all of us at some point or another, at some time or another. Maybe we're no longer sure this is the way that we want to live in every respect. I'm not talking about somebody who is wrestling with spiritual doubt or sometimes falls but then gets back up again and fights again to live the Christian life. I'm talking about somebody who's coming to have convictions and practices contrary to the community covenant. We don't want people to put themselves in the compromising position where their actions are contrary to their promises. And so this is my prayer for you my hope for you, that you find your commitment to Christ deepening during your time at Wheaton in spite of all difficulties, and also that you find increasing joy in promise keeping. Like the student who said the community covenant is beautiful because it points to something more than what I believe. It says that a community can engage in self-sacrifice and commit to something as a community. Now, when we do that, when we engage in that self-sacrifice, commit to something as a community and make that choice, it brings along with it certain binding obligations. You make the choice, and then the choice makes you. And many choices in life are like that. They require 
further commitments. Any job situation is like that. Certainly a marriage covenant is an obvious example. You make covenant vows in the presence of God and other witnesses. You're saying no to any other sexual relationship or romantic attachment. It's a choice freely given, but then once you make that choice, it's a binding commitment. And here's what I want you to see this morning, that the places where keeping covenant seem most costly actually give you the greatest spiritual opportunity. The commitment that is hardest to keep, the promise that is most difficult, perhaps most contrary to your nature, that may also be the most important. That's the place where you're likely to pay a greater cost, but just for that reason will strengthen your ability to keep a commitment and you will find God's blessing in it. You know, sometimes it's tempting to pretend that the community covenant comes with a line item veto. You're, you're willing to go along with most of it as long as you can cross out a word here, maybe squiggle through a bullet point there, possibly even delete a whole paragraph. Of course, that's not the way a community covenant works. The whole point is that we make this commitment together, the whole commitment. So rather than mentally drawing a line through certain parts of the community covenant, instead pull out a highlighter and emphasize the promises that will cost you the most to keep. And as you find God's grace to follow through, the kind of grace that we prayed about this morning in the liturgy, you will strengthen spiritual muscles for the kingdom work of Jesus Christ. And understand that when you pay the price of commitment, you have everything to gain. This was true for our Savior when he kept covenant for us and counted the cost of his commitment to the cross. The price for him was physical torment, the horrors of death under the wrath of God. But the gain was resurrection from the grave and everlasting glory for everyone who believes in him. And that was true for him, and now the promise is for us. Christ calls us to self-denial, to cross-bearing, not to take anything away from us, but because having laid down his life for us, now he invites us to lay down our lives for him, and having taken his life back up again by the power of the Spirit, he knows as risen Lord what unimaginable joy is waiting for us as we lay down our lives for him. Jim Elliott gained this joy the moment that he died in the Curare River. So did Nate Saint and Ed McCulley. We know this, of course, from the promise of Scripture, but we also know this from the testimony of those who killed them, because after members of the Warani tribe came to faith in Christ and shared the full story of that tragic day, part of their testimony was that as those missionaries lay dying, they both saw and heard a heavenly chorus, white in their raiment, outshining the very sun. There were holy angels who had come down by the riverside to welcome the sons of God into their everlasting habitations. And so as you consider the cost of Christian discipleship, not just keeping the community covenant, but more deeply, the whole life of self-denial that following Jesus demands, remember that you are no fool if you give up what you cannot keep to gain what you could never lose. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise for the saving work of Jesus Christ for the dying testimony of those who have given their lives for him, for the privilege in small ways today of living a self-denying, self-sacrificing life that returns to the honor of our Savior. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.